Good morning, everybody. I'm happy to uh, call this um, uh, hearing to order. We, this hearing uh, room was used about a, a month ago for Bring Your Children to Work Day. And uh, we had, uh, the room was like full of uh, children, our staff, and Democrats, Republicans. We had just a, just a lovely time, a lovely celebration. And uh, I think we have, this is like, somebody got the, got the memo a little bit late, but Eric, I think your son is here. And he's 14, he looks like he's about 44. I mean, what a big guy. <laughs> but uh, we're gonna watch to see if his lips move when you speak. So there you go. But uh, to those of you who are not children of our witnesses, we welcome you as, uh, as, as, as well. Happy to call the, uh, the hearing to, to order. Uh, today, uh, we're here to conduct, uh, as you know, uh, oversight of one of the US Army Corps of Engineers' primary missions. Uh, and that's uh, ECOS, e uh, ecosystem restoration. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers work to support commerce through navigation and flood control is, I don't think it's an overstatement to say it's uh, the backbone of our economy. It's a big part of what we do in this, uh, in this nation. And still uh, addressing the toll that this commerce takes on our environment is and will continue to be uh, a top priority for us on this committee and also a top priority for the Army Corps of Engineers. From a large scale, multi-decade initiatives to small focused uh, projects. The uh, Corps uh, ecosystem restoration work is critical, has been, remains critical. This is especially true as uh, climate change continues to threaten communities, wildlife, and our economy, all of which depend on healthy uh, ecosystems. As uh, many of us know, the Biennial Water Resources Development Act, known as WERDA, establishes the authorities for the Corps' uh, future work. In uh, the, I think it was 1986 WERDA, uh, Congress first directed the Corps to lead eco uh, restoration uh, efforts for the upper, uh, upper Mississippi River, laying the foundation for an expanded environmental restoration role for the agency. In every WERDA since then, Congress has expanded the Corps' ability to address critical ecosystem restoration. From the, the Great Lakes to the Gulf Coast, from the Chesapeake Bay to the San Francisco Bay Delta, communities across our country have benefited from this important work. Most recently, we expanded the Corps' definition of ecosystem restoration in WERDA 2022 to include factors such as climate change and coastal and riverine restoration. Last month, Assistant Secretary Connor sat right there and he testified for our committee that the Corps' budget request for fiscal 2024 included more than $650 million for aquatic ecosystem restoration, the most ever in a budget request. The growing uh, amount paired with mo the more than $1.9 billion in the bipartisan infrastructure law highlights Congress's ongoing commitment to the Corps' work. These funds, however, are only the tip of the spear when it comes to the long-term needs of the Army Corps in this regard. Today's hearing will help us better understand the current size and scope of ecosystem restoration needs and what more our committee, this committee, can do to address community environmental restoration efforts. The Accords Ecosystem Restoration Portfolio includes roughly 140 ongoing ecosystem restoration construction projects and studies. These initiatives uh, focus on the, the restoring uh, the landscape and hydrology to a more natural conditions and, and connecting restoration and navigation projects, a win-win, uh, not just for our environment, but also for our economy. For example, uh, let's take Poplar Island in Maryland. Poplar Island in, it could be Popular Island in, uh, in Maryland, but it turned out almost to be a non-existent island. In, uh, in, uh, in Maryland, but originally home uh, to, I think, to more than 1,000 acres in size, home to a small community of, of residents. And from 1846 uh, until recently, the island had slowly eroded, as some of you know, uh, from uh, what it was down to about four acres. Imagine that, four acres. Uh, thanks to the, the Corps' work uh, pairing dredged materials from Baltimore Harbor and channel maintenance projects, uh, with um, environmental restoration, Poplar Island has been restored from four acres to more than 1,700 acres today. 
The project exemplifies how the Corps' ecosystem restoration mandate supports the economic activity we depend on from our ports and harbors while creating wetlands and the wildlife habitats. And according to Senator Cardin, it's a beautiful place to visit. I'm sure when he arrives, he will uh, reaffirm that. Uh, today, we'll hear more uh, from our witnesses about the Corps' role in specific ecosystem restoration efforts. That includes the Everglades in Florida, along with Tres Rios in Arizona, and the Crab Bank Seabird, Seabird Sanctuary in South Carolina. Before we do, let me offer a couple of thoughts on each of these efforts and then turn it over to Senator Capito. First, uh, there is the Corps-led Everglades restoration, which includes Lake uh, Okeechobee, Okeechobee, Lake Okeechobee, uh, the second largest freshwater body in the contiguous United States. And if Senator Stabenow were here, she would tell us that uh, Lake Michigan is number one. The, the effort uh, and uh, Lake Okeechobee is the largest ecosystem res restoration effort in the Corps' federal uh, uh, portfolio. According to the Corps, these federal investments in Florida are generating annual cost savings of over $300 million by preventing flood damage to property while fortifying water supply infrastructure and protecting fish and wildlife. Next, there is Tres Rios in Phoenix, Arizona, an aquatic ecosystem found in the desert that unifies flood control, ecosystem restoration, and recreation. This project includes an engineered levee as well as the restoration of over 1,200 acres of wetlands, hiking trails, nature trails, and much more. The, these wetlands are critical for a state that is going through an historic drought. And last but not uh, least, there is Crab Bank Seabird Sanctuary. I love that. Crab Bank Seabird, uh, Seabird uh, Sanctuary in South Carolina. This project is considered a landmark legacy of Charleston Harbor post-45 deepening project. The deepening work from below the water resulted in the dredge materials for 42 acres of prime nesting ground above the water for over 15 species of shore and seabirds, another win-win. And let me just close, if I could, by thanking members of uh, our staffs and uh, for, uh, for the great work that, that you all did on WERDA uh, 22. Uh, I hear, uh, not every day, not uh, every day from our colleagues, but uh, frequently from our colleagues, Democrat and Republican from across the country, uh, their gratitude for the work that this committee does. And I know that uh, as hard as the, you and I work, we know we couldn't do any of this without the great work of our staff. So I want to just say that again. We look forward to hearing from each of you uh, today on your experiences with the Corps and what more Congress might be doing to support uh, those critical efforts. Our hearing today will also help inform our oversight efforts and future legislative action on ecosystem restoration, specifically as we gear up for WERDA 2024. I can't believe we're about ready to start this again. WERDA 2024, which is just around the corner. With that, I'm happy to turn over to Ranking Member Senator Capito for her opening remarks. It's good to be with you. Welcome. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman Carper, uh, for calling today's hearing. Uh, since 2014, the committee has kept to a biennial uh, word of schedule authorizing water resource projects and setting national policies for the Civil Works program. As, as the chairman was saying, I look forward to continuing that track record next year. It does seem like deja vu all over again. I think we, we just did this. The EPW committee also plays an important role overseeing how the Corps executes these authorities and funding provided by the Congress. Today's hearing will focus on one of the Corps' main mission areas, which is aquatic ecosystem restoration. This hearing will allow us to learn more about the successes and challenges of three of the Corps' aquatic ecosystem restoration projects. And I would like to extend my appreciation for our witnesses here today. Look forward to hearing your perspectives on these matters. Lessons learned from completed and ongoing projects are critical to informing what, if any, modifications are needed to the Corps' existing authorities in future WERDA legislation. When designed appropriately, aquatic ecosystem restoration projects can play an important role in restoring critical habitats while also mitigating loss of property and life. The scale of these projects varies greatly across the country, and the Corps uses different authorities and programs to carry them out. Large-scale projects are not the only option for protecting and restoring our aquatic ecosystems. 
Often small projects or modifications to existing water resources infrastructure can yield positive outcomes to aquatic uh, ecosystems at a low cost. This flexibility is key to ensuring that the Corps' design solutions are tailored to address the diverse aquatic ecosystem restorations of all communities. In my opinion, the three projects that are the focus of today's hearing do a good job of underscoring all of these points. While the Corps' eco, uh, aquatic ecosystem restoration efforts are important, the Corps and Congress must balance these efforts with the nation's needs under the two main missions of the Corps, navigation and flood and coastal storm risk management. As we'll hear today, win-win solutions are possible. I'm excited that uh, Lorraine Higgin from the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources is here today. The South Carolina DNR partnered with the Corps in 2021 on the Crab Bank Seabird Sanctuary in Mount Pleasant, a beautiful spot, South Carolina. This project was completed under the Corps' 204 authority. This authority allows the Corps to carry out aquatic ecosystem restoration projects in connection with dredging an existing navigation project. The federal cost of a project under this authority cannot exceed $10 million. For this particular project, the Corps and its partners utilized dredged materials from the Charleston Harbor deepening project for the replacement of the Crab Bank Seabird Sanctuary. This project, like others, faced initial challenges. However, the Corps and the non-federal sponsor were able to adjust their game plan and find a solution that benefited shorebirds without impeding on economic opportunities for the local community. Since the completion of the project, the small island has seen a return of shorebirds and seabirds. This project is an excellent example of how federal, local, state, and private groups can partner together to provide meaningful, lasting results in an effective manner. So I know I uh, look forward to Ms. Higgins' testimony because she will share how this uh, project's story uh, in South Carolina. Our witnesses' project-specific stories will help us understand how we can balance our water resources needs and maximize the use of our taxpayer dollars. I look forward to hearing also about the challenges that, and suggested improvements to existing authorities as we prepare for the next WERDA. Last month, we had, as you mentioned, we held a hearing on the Army Corps fiscal year 2024 budget request and implementation of WERDA 2022 with Secretary Connor and Lieutenant General Spillman. It was evident at the hearing that each of our states face a diverse range of water resources issues and opportunities. I am hopeful that we take lessons learned from the projects discussed today and use them to improve water resources projects of all types across the country. Chairman Carper, I look forward to continuing our partnership to develop the next bipartisan word of bill. And again, I express my gratitude to our witnesses. Senator Capito, thank you uh, mm -hmm. so much for those remarks. And uh, now we're going to hear from our panel of witnesses who will share uh, with us uh, their perspectives on the Corps' uh, ecosystem restoration uh, projects. And we're going to uh, start off with uh, Eric Eichenberg. Let me just make uh, some brief comments about, uh, about uh, Eric. Chief uh, Executive Office of the Everglades Foundation. Environmental nonprofit that's focused on restoring America's Everglades. He has served in this role for over 10 years, leading a team of nationally recognized scientists, educators, policy experts, and communications and development professionals. Mr. Eichenberg and the team are committed to protecting the roughly 3 million acres of endangered habitat that is vital to Florida's economic and environmental viability. Uh, Mr. Eichenberger, we thank you for uh, being with us today, and you may uh, proceed uh, with your statement. It'll be made uh, uh, part of the record in its entirety. Thank you so much. Please proceed, and welcome. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Carper, uh, Ranking Member Capito, uh, and to the committee, uh, my name, as the Chairman mentioned, is Eric Eichenberg, and I'm privileged to be CEO of the Everglades Foundation, uh, celebrating its 30th anniversary and help helping to restore America's Everglades through science, advocacy, and education. I want to thank the committee for this hearing and for inviting me here today. Restoring America's Everglades is producing benefits far beyond their ecological value, including driving Florida's clean water economy, protecting drinking water supplies, providing flood risk mitigation, and carbon sequestration. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has been an indispensable partner in this undertaking, together with the state of Florida. Thanks to recent federal and state investments, we are at a point of incredible progress 
and momentum. Following congressional passage of WERDA 2000, Everglades Restoration incorporates 68 uh, separate public work pro projects that will store, clean, and send water south on the Florida Peninsula. It is a national example of how traditional and natural infrastructure can be combined on a massive scale. Under the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, or SERP, these projects were funded with a 50-50 federal state cost share. We thank Congress for their recent investments, including the funding to the Army Corps within the bipartisan infrastructure law, and for your recognition of the importance of America's Everglades. The Army Corps has completed several non-SERP projects, like the Herbert Hoover Dyke Repair, and in partnership with the state of Florida, restoration of the Kissimmee River, and the construction of bridges along the Tamiami Trail. In recent years, the pace of SERP projects is unprecedented. For example, east of Lake Okeechobee in Martin County, construction of the C-44 Reservoir is complete. East of Naples, a 55,000-acre habitat restoration project in the Picayune Strand is nearly finished. South of Lake Okeechobee, the Corps recently broke ground on the crown jewel of Everglades restoration, the EAA Reservoir. This reservoir is a national priority and a model for prudent and efficient way to fund mega projects with taxpayer dollars. These and other projects confirm that restoration works, and I cannot overstate the importance of these results. With improved southerly flow, we are already seeing habitats reestablished in areas of Everglades National Park that just five years ago were parched by drought for half the year. As you may know, Florida's coastal estuaries have been plagued by toxic blue-green algae that closes beaches, restricts fishing, and is a harmful threat to wildlife and people. The algae blooms are fed by the unavoidable dumping of polluted water from Lake Okeechobee. The fortified Herbert Hoover Dyke and the EAA Reservoir will reduce those harmful discharges by 55%, having a profound positive impact on Florida's tourism-based economy. Storing, cleaning, and sending this clean water south is essential to Florida Bay. Its gin clear waters and lush seagrass meadows makes Florida Bay the fishing capital of the world, a body of water alive with manatees, dolphins, and a wide variety of coveted game fish. Today, however, the bay is suffering from too little fresh water. A restored Everglades will also provide a natural defense against saltwater intrusion due to sea level rise. Flowing more water south will protect our nation's largest mangrove forest. Restoration will also protect existing peat soils in the Everglades that enhance the sequestration of new carbon. We're at a critical juncture. With sustained federal and state investments, this can be the Everglades decade in which we achieve the dream of robust, healthy river of grass following a century of development. The stakes are high, both for the nine million people who rely on the Everglades for fresh water and for the nation as a whole. Florida's tourism-based economy depends on clean water, and our economic research shows that Everglades restoration yields a four-to-one investment. Senators, you should be proud of the bipartisan progress in restoring America's Everglades. On behalf of the anglers, the realtors, the fishing guides, the business owners, and the millions who depend on the Everglades, let me say thank you, and please do not stop now. All right, thank you, and, and we won't. Um, but do you pronounce your name, Balop? Balop? Okay, Ms. Balop, please, uh, please proceed. Oh, welcome, we're delighted that you've joined us. I appreciate the opportunity to speak before the committee about the importance of Army Corps support for ecosystem restoration projects. I'd like to invite um, Chairman Carper and Ranking Member Capito, and especially Senator Kelly for inviting me to be here today. 
And the city of Phoenix is the fifth largest city in the United States and is the local sponsor for multiple U.S. Army Corps of Engineers um, ecosystem restoration projects associated with the Salt River, which is our main river channel through Phoenix and the surrounding um, cities. These projects are part of Senator McCain's Rio Reimagined legacy for the Phoenix metropolitan area. Rio Reimagined recently became the 20th EPA Urban Waters Federal Partnership location. Historically, urban uses of the Salt River have included industrial activities such as landfills and sand and gravel mining. The construction of federal dams upstream has resulted in highly altered river flows, and as a result, there's been significant degradation of ecosystem values and reduced recreation opportunities. In the arid western United States, riparian areas are estimated to be less than 2% of total land area, are considered the most productive habitat, and provide important water quality benefits. 70% of threatened and endangered vertebrates in Arizona depend on riparian habitat along rivers. In Arizona, it is estimated that as much as 90% of riparian forests have been lost. Invasive species such as salt cedar, a highly competitive shrubby tree, are now in almost every drainage system in the Southwest. Since the 1990s, Phoenix has worked with the Corps to achieve habitat restoration and improve flood risk management on the Salt River. The first major project to be completed was Rio Salado Phoenix, located in a historically disadvantaged area which restored five miles of the Salt River and provides valuable recreation and education opportunities for the community. Downstream of this completed project are two congressionally authorized core projects that have not yet been completed, Rio Salado Oeste and Trace Rios. These are both ecosystem restoration, flood risk management, and recreation projects. When combined with the completed Rio Salado Phoenix, these will create approximately 19 contiguous miles of restored river corridor through Phoenix, directly benefiting river flows, habitat, wildlife, heat risk, and access to the river in disadvantaged communities. This is why, for the last 10 years, the city has been focused on obtaining the support and funding from the Corps and our congressional delegation to complete these two projects. Today, I'd like to highlight Trace Rios project to illustrate the multiplicity of benefits from Corps ecosystem restoration funding. Trace Rios, when complete, will cover approximately seven miles of river channel and the adjoining bank, including almost 400 acres of constructed wetlands, a levee, in-river restoration, and effluent treatment elements. Trace Rios' use of constructed wetlands to treat wastewater using natural processes make this a unique core project that helps compliance with regulatory standards while simultaneously providing quality habitat. By implementing this eco-friendly infrastructure, the city has avoided the need to spend $375 million on additional infrastructure for the 91st Avenue wastewater treatment plant. Through the treatment and direction of wastewater, combined with the invasive species removal and native species plantings, the area supports more than 200 species of birds and other wildlife, including some species list listed as threatened or endangered under the Endangered Species Act. This habitat also provides recreational access to natural river spaces in an urban environment and offers benefits from carbon sequestration, shading, and other cooling effects, which are important heat mitigation elements in our desert city. A substantial amount of the invasive tree salt cedar was removed as part of Trace Rios. This removal and the preservation and additional planting of native vegetation reduces fire risk, both in terms of fire severity and frequency. Salt cedar removal is also beneficial to native habitat by creating a more conducive environment for native plants to germinate and grow. The river channel through Trace Rios facilitates passive aquifer recharge by allowing water to naturally infiltrate groundwater, while the levees constructed on the north bank of the Salt and Gila rivers protect nearby neighborhoods from flooding. So as I've shared, the benefits from Trace Rios are wide ranging from habitat to flood reduction to recreational opportunities. The City of Phoenix is appreciative of the many benefits that have come from collaborating with the Corps, and we fully support the Corps' mission in undertaking and completing ecosystem restoration, particularly in the Southwest. This year, the Corps Los Angeles District has been working on a post-authorization change report to update the costs for the remaining phases of Trace Rios. The City of Phoenix will be seeking an authorization for construction in the 2024 WERDA bill to complete Trace Rios' in-river restoration and trailheads. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. And uh, now, uh, Ms. Riggins, welcome. Good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, I'm so excited to be here to, today to share with you the success of the Crab Bank Ecosystem Restoration Project in South Carolina. For the record, my name is Lorianne Riggin, and I'm the Director of the Office of Environmental Programs for the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. I've been with the agency for 17 years and had the pleasure of working with many interested conservation partners, the surrounding Mount Pleasant community, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Charleston District to help oversee the Crab Bank Ecosystem Restoration Project. Crab Bank is a dedicated Heritage Trust property and a seabird sanctuary managed and owned by the South Carolina DNR. It is located in the Charleston Harbor near the mouth of Shim Creek in the Mount Pleasant community. Crab Bank was originally formed with the placement of dredge material in the 1950s. However, over time, due to wave action, tropical storms, and hurricanes, this important seabird sanctuary eroded away. In the early 2000s, Crab Bank was approximately 23 acres, but by 2017, Hurricane Irma came and washed away the remaining half acre of high ground in the early fall, which removed any opportunity for nesting birds the following summer. Prior to Hurricane Irma, the island served as an important predator-free refuge for a variety of state wildlife action plan conservation priority species. Although all these species may not nest on the island each year, here are a few examples that have nested here at Crab Bank. Brown pelican, royal tern, sandwich tern, gull-billed tern, black skimmer, laughing gull, American oyster catcher, willet, snowy egret, and tricolored heron. Besides providing nesting habitat, the sanctuary provides winter loafing and feeding habitat for numerous species, including large flocks of shorebirds that roost on the island at night. Of the 65 seabird, shorebird, and wading bird species collectively known as waterbirds that utilize South Carolina's coastal habitats throughout the year, 47 are listed in our state's wildlife action plan as high conservation concern. Three are federally listed and four are state listed. These water birds nest in colonies with thousands of other birds laying their eggs on the ground. Crab Bank is one of the few places on the coast where these species can come nest undisturbed from human presence. This is incredibly important as lack of nesting habitat may be limiting shorebird population stability and growth. Research shows that shorebird and seabird populations have shrunk overall by 70% in the last 50 to 70 years with an accelerated decline during the last three generations for most shorebird species. The coast of South Carolina is the most rapidly developing area of our state, and much of this is occurring along our shorelines, which has the potential to further decrease abundance and distribution of coastal water birds throughout their life cycle. In addition, increased recreational use along our shorelines further limits available nesting habitat. Thus, restoration of crab bank was an extremely high priority for the survival of many coastal water birds. The South Carolina DNR had an incredible once-in-a-lifetime opportunity with the deepening of the Charleston Harbor to partner as a non-federal sponsor with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Charleston District under Section 204 of the Continuing Authorities Program to restore Crab Bank and support shorebird populations. Construction on Crab Bank was completed in seven weeks in 2021. Approximately 660,000 cubic yards of dredge material was placed with varying elevations to, to diversify habitat. This increased crab bank in size from less than half an acre to 80 acres total, with 32 acres of available shorebird and seabird habitat above mean high water. As of June 5th, 2023, the overall project expenditures cost shared 65 to 35% between the federal government and South Carolina DNR have totaled $695,939. The purpose of the project included restoration and enhancement of an important seabird sanctuary, protection of the salt marsh located near Crown Bank, and development of wildlife viewing and shorebird educational opportunities for Shim Creek ecotourism and the greater Charleston area. Through the Water Resources Development Act, the South Carolina DNR and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers were able to successfully meet all the goals of this project. In 2022, Crab Bank provided nesting habitat for 107 pairs of leased tern. 192 pairs of gold tern, 283 pairs of black skimmer, and eight American oyster catcher pairs. I'm happy to share today that nesting activity is in full swing for 2023, and there have been two nesting pairs observed so far of the state-threatened Wilson's plover. The South Carolina DNR is thrilled with the benefit that the Water Resources Development Act Authority provided to restore crab bank. This project was of great benefit to the public by supporting shorebird conservation and the beneficial use of the material dredge from the Charleston Harbor. The South Carolina Department of Natural Resources would like to encourage the committee to continue to provide authorization for important ecosystem restoration projects like Crab Bank. In closing, thank you for the opportunity to share the success of Crab Bank. 
This incredible project will have a lasting and important impact on water birds and the citizens and visitors to South Carolina for generations to come. Thank you. Uh, thank you all uh, for, for your testimonies. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, Balf, I, I want to make sure we pronounce your, your last name correctly. It could be Bal Balf is in ballet, or it could be Balf is in ball game. <laughs> How do you pronounce it? It is Balf. Balf. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, you mentioned John McCain uh, in your testimony, didn't you? Our uh, former colleague, uh, he and I were um, um, naval officers, uh, served together in the uh, Vietnam War. He was a hero, great hero, and uh, later he and I were elected the House Representatives together the same day, joined uh, forces again uh, in the House and then later in the United States Senate. Uh, he was not a member of this committee, to be someone who cared a lot about the en environment. Take just a minute and talk about uh, his involvement in this, uh, what uh, the, uh, um, the uh, project, if you will, that you just discussed, discussed br very briefly. What, what did John do? What was his role? Yes, Senator Carper, thank you. I'm happy to do that. Um, Senator McCain really spearheaded what is called the Rio Reimagine Initiative in Phoenix, and he's been very supportive of all of the ecosystem restoration that's been happening through Phoenix, but also in surrounding cities. So Rio Reimagined um, really came to be because of him, and it is a 56-mile stretch of the Salt and Gila Rivers through uh, the Phoenix metropolitan area that involves uh, many different cities, uh, tribal nations, and nonprofits, or educational ed institutions, at Arizona State University, for example, that have all come together to collaborate and look for ways to work together to improve the overall river corridor through this metropolitan area for the benefit of all of our citizens. Good, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, this Memorial Day, uh, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the uh, return and release of uh, hundreds of uh, POWs, Vietnam uh, era POWs, released by the Vietnamese all those years ago, and uh, we, we celebrated their lives. John and I, uh, John McCain and I, and, uh, John Kerry worked together with the former president, George Herbert Walker Bush, to uh, get the uh, Vietnamese uh, government to turn over information on hundreds of additional uh, missing in actions uh, from, the, from the war, and uh, that led to the normalization of relations between the United States and Vietnam. They're now one of our top 10 trading partners in the whole country. And U.S. Navy vessels call on Vietnamese ports, and we have a, a remarkably strong economic and growing, uh, actually, defense relationship with them. So that's a, a bit far afield, but uh, I can't let the, the mention of John's name go by without saying some of that. Let's see. Um, I like to quote, quote Mark Twain uh, from time to time. He said a lot of things that are worth remembering. One of the things that he said is that the two most important days of our life for the day we're born and the day we figure out why. And I understand in your life that there's an interesting twist to that story. And that quote has, has special meaning to, to you. When did you figure out why you were born? How, what grade might you have been in? Was that direct question directed at me, Senator yeah. Carper? <laughs> Are we ever in the eighth grade? Um. Uh, I'm gonna, okay, okay, wrong witness, wrong witness. <laughs> All right, we'll try it, we'll try it. Okay, we'll try you, Ms. Riggin, same question. Yes. Yeah, so, when, when did you figure out why you were born? Oh, uh, I would then say. Then we'll come back and figure out why Mr. Ms. There Bob are was lots born. of whys. Uh, the most recent why is my nine year old son. But early on, as a child, I had a strong desire to make a difference in this world, and my strong desire was to make a difference for natural resources, and I learned that at a very early age that that's where I needed to focus my energies, and I have a lot of it. Um, and so, I believe you do. <laughs> and so in eighth grade, I uh, sent a letter to the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources requesting information about what kind of jobs could I do for the state and serve the state and its citizens and the natural resources. And they provided me um, some information, and I ran with it and, and got a degree and got my foot in the door, and I've been there ever since. So right. Good. Um, I'm going to turn to uh, Mr. Eichenberg, your, whose son is actually sitting back on the first row over his right shoulder, 14-year-old son, and uh, we welcome both of you to uh, today. For, uh, uh, for folks uh, that like uh, young people who might be like his contemporary uh, in high school or maybe in college or, uh, or not, but why, why should they care about, why should the, his generation, your son's generation, care about what we're discussing here today? Why is it relevant in their lives? Well, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for that question. Um, in the spirit of bipartisanship, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, your former colleague, uh, Senator Bob Graham, 
Um, when the Everglades restoration was passed in the year 2000, uh, he worked with my former boss, Congressman Clay Shaw, to ensure that um, that was a bipartisan effort, and it continues to be that way to this day. That's great. Um, and for children um, watching our body politic to find um, our environmental issues where we can come together in a bipartisan way, I think it's a great example for the next generation. And I will just say that um, 10 years ago, uh, from my perspective, watching uh, what was billed the lost summer in Florida due to um, algae outbreaks um, stemming from the Army Corps discharging water from Lake Okeechobee, it rallied uh, voices that had not been at the table, uh, business leaders, tourism officials, realtors, uh, these men and women became the foot soldiers in ensuring that we have uh, restoration, that we can uh, not only do it this generation, but then pass it on to the next generation. For me, that was a moment to realize that what we're doing, it's greater than ourselves, but we're able to pass it on soon to the next generation. Good. Uh, Bob uh, Graham and, and Clay Shaw, two good friends, and uh, nice to hear their names again. Bob Graham was a governor of Florida. Uh, and, and, and also a United States Senator from Florida for many, many years. When I was thinking of running for the United States Senate, I, I went down to Florida to, to meet with him, had breakfast, and uh, he arranged for me to meet some folks down there. I um, remember I asked him, I said, uh, when uh, you've had the opportunity to be a U.S. Senator, you had the opportunity to be governor, which, which job do you prefer and, uh, and why? And he said, you know, he used a football analogy. He said, uh, when... Um, when you're, um, the, when you're the governor, you're the quarterback on the field calling every play. And uh, when you're the uh, United States Senator, you're the uh, general manager sitting up in a box watching the game. And I said, well, which do you prefer? And he said, well, I like to be you know, on the field calling every play. But he said, every team needs a good general manager. And he said, besides, the seats are pretty good. The seats are pretty good. And with that, let me yield the floor to Senator from West Virginia. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Ms. Riggin, let's talk about the, the Crab Bank uh, Seabird Sanctuary. I have trouble saying that whole thing at, at, at once. Um, I know it was a public-private partnership. And uh, can you talk about the public-private partnerships, both in this case and others that you see uh, in your state, and how they really um, help to get the completion of the projects? Absolutely happy to. So when we first started with the Crab Bank project, we had a short timeline. So we were in 2019, and we had a feasibility report that gave us an estimate of what the total cost of the project would be, which would have required the state to have $1.4 million sitting, waiting, and ready. Um, with Given budget constraints, we, we figured out we needed some help. And so we also already had conservation interest groups like the Coastal Expedition Foundation, which is a nonprofit arm of a local ecotourism outfit, the Coastal Conservation League, Audubon, South Carolina, that had the expertise to help fundraise. And under the state's um, statute, we have something called the Non-Game and Natural Area Statute that allows the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources to receive funds for the purpose of non-game management. And so we utilize that funding opportunity under that existing state statute and the expertise of our conservation partners to help us rally with the com within the community to help leverage additional funds to bring to the table so that we were sitting, waiting, and ready for that $1.4 million had that been the ask of the Department of Natural Resources mm -hmm. as a non-federal sponsor. Mm -hmm. In addition, as we were ha on that short timeline of just 12 months, Audubon, South Carolina, went out and applied for a National Fish and Wildlife Foundation grant to help supplement funding costs as well. Um, and that was a one-to-one -one match ratio. So that was a $1.4 million ask that we all had to come up with a $700,000 match. Mm -hmm. um, so pulled that all together to have enough funding that we needed, plus that allowed us to springboard future projects from that existing pot of money that we've now created as the Coastal Bird Conservation mm -hmm. Program. Um, so Crab Bank was a starting block um, for that additional funding mm -hmm. to go further for shorebird conservation. Right, right. I'm sure, Mr. Eichenberg, you've jumped through a few hoops yourself to try to figure these things out, the public-private partnership portion. Uh, Senator, it's a, it's a key part of uh, where we are today with Everglades restoration. Um, certainly the core working with the non-federal partner, in this case the South Florida Water Management District, but bringing a multitude of other stakeholders uh, to the table. I, I, I want to applaud the Corps for allowing those uh, differing voices to be heard. 
um, and to be taking that feedback. Um, I would submit to you that this issue, restoring the Everglades, has become a national model. Um, thanks to the Congress in 2000, you, you set out a plan. We know, this, we know the problem, we have a solution, and we're working in a co collaborative way to make sure it's uh, successful. Um, would you say, uh, are there any, uh, I'll go back to Ms. Riggin, are there any additional authorities that you feel that would allow the core to better assist non-federal partners? The reason I think that's important is for the examples that you all put forward, but we have heard some rumbling sometimes, having dealt with the core myself, sometimes um, uh, needing a little bit more uh, assistance for them to be able to help their non-federal partners. Did you find that was a challenge or not? Are you finding that? I didn't really find that was a challenge from mm -hmm. the CAP 204 perspective. I think, you know, planning assistance with the state's program, which is something else that the Corps does, that that would be another avenue where they need additional support mm -hmm. to provide help. I know within the Charleston district, there's a long list when the state comes to the Corps and says, hey, I have an interest and need your expertise on these mm -hmm. items. Um, I think that's an area that probably additional support could be given to help them address a lot of the planning assistance for the state's request. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have a uh, comment, Ms. Bailiff, on that particular issue? Any other authorities the Corps might need to better assist uh, non-federal partners? Yeah, I, I think that I certainly agree with, with Ms. Grant Riggin. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one other thing I would add is that um, additional uh, resources for the core once the civil works project is complete is sometimes um, very useful uh, as things come up over time um, with these ecosystem restoration projects to be able to continue to work with the core on them and finding solutions can be quite a useful exercise so um, I would add that thank you Senator Kemp thanks uh, Mr. Eichenberg do you have any other I have to go to another hearing here, or, and, and so I'm going to apologize. I'm going to leave after I hear from Mr. Eichenberg. Senator, any opportunity where the non-federal partner could maybe get out ahead on a particular um, portion of a project? Uh, the Corps has demonstrated a willingness to let the South Florida Water Management District do that, and it speeds up the implementation. Um, so we appreciate the Corps at least willing to uh, do that, and if there's additional authority to allow that to to occur even in a greater uh, manner, we would certainly support that. Thank you all. All right, we've been joined by a couple of fellows from out west, and uh, we're delighted you could, uh, could come. We got one of our witnesses brought a 14-year-old son with him today. And would, you, would, you, would your son raise his hand? Raise his hand. Sir. Go ahead. Raise your hand. There you go. You got uh, some people up here. Uh, I think uh, Senator Capito has a couple of sons. I have three sons. And Alex Zapadilla uh, has how many? Three? Two? Three? Your, your guy's a little bit younger. Uh, three sons as well. And all three will be on summer vacation as of this Friday. So uh, please pray for us. <laughs> You're in our prayers. <laughs> but right now, you're recognized. <laughs> Any questions you want to ask? Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, these, are, uh, these conversations are all too timely. I think as uh, a lot of us in the field know uh, the significance of a recent Supreme Court ruling that limited the scope of the Clean Water Act, and more specifically, the federal government's ability to protect thousands of miles of rivers, streams, creeks, and adjacent wetlands throughout the western United States. Uh, at the California State Water Board, this is how they framed it last month. Wetlands provide an important buffer and filter, prote and filter protecting our nation's waters. But in the semi-arid watershed, most will not be able to satisfy the court's requirements for a, quote, continuous surface connection to bodies that are, quote, waters of the United States in their own right so that there's no clear demarcation between waters and wetlands. Ms. Balif, as uh, given your role in the city of Phoenix, I wanted to ask, are there particular challenges posed by an increasingly arid west for aquatic ecosystem restoration projects? 
and, and I guess the, the bigger picture question here is how important is the ecosystem restoration, not just for the restoration of habitat, but for the economic health of communities as well as water quality, recreational opportunities, et cetera? Yeah, thank you, Senator Padilla. Um, yes, it is, it's very important, and it's also challenging in the desert southwest. Um, but ecosystem restoration, I would argue, especially along our rivers, is one of the most valuable things that, that we can do in terms of ecosystem restoration. These, these riparian areas are some of the most productive and rich areas and, and have the most um, benefit. They also draw a lot of economic interest um, in development along the banks as well. And so um, it also draws a lot of people into the river and really helps them connect with nature, which I think we know from social sciences really provides a lot of um, mental and emotional and social and physical benefits to our communities. So um, while it's a challenge, I think it's a challenge well worth um, pursuing. Great. Um, I know in your uh, testimony, you, make, you mentioned that the genesis of the Tres Rios Ecosystem Restoration Project was a need to treat wastewater uh, discharges. As a native of Los Angeles, I know all too well uh, the challenges of restoring aquatic ecosystems in a highly paved urban area like Los Angeles. Uh, thanks to many years of hard work, um, as well as funding from the bipartisan infrastructure law, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the city of L.A. is making progress to restore historic riparian and freshwater marsh habitat along 11 miles of the 52-mile-long Los Angeles River. Uh, but referencing back to the Tres Rios project, um, any, uh, uh, you know, in, in uh, brief, how is that um, impacting drought resiliency? I assume it's been helpful. I assume there's been progress. Anything you can highlight? And then, once again, more broadly, what advice would you have for uh, Western cities looking to improve water quality and to restore habitats while facing all the same challenges? Yes, thank you, Senator Padilla. Um, so I'm going to try and remember all of those questions. I might need right. to how's refresh, it, refresh, how's, refresh me on a couple of them as I go on. How's the project working, the Terrestrials project? How's that work? I'm sorry, say that again. How's it working? How's oh, yeah. So, so Trace Rios um, was originally constructed, as you say, to treat wastewater effluents. So uh, the water is treated at our wastewater treatment plant, and then it goes into these constructed wetlands that actually help to polish and finish, remove some nitrogen, chlorine attenuation, things like that, to meet Clean Water Act requirements before we then discharge it into the river. In fact, all of the, the water that supports the Trace Rios ecosystem restoration does, in fact, come from that wastewater treatment plant. So all of the water from that wastewater treatment plant plant is beneficially reused, which I think is one of the really great aspects of this and a really good way to use water, um, especially in a time of drought, because it's not only going into the ecosystem, it's going downstream and being used in other ways downstream as well. Okay. And then just again, given that experience, uh, whether it's design, whether it's uh, funding sources, what advice would you have to other jurisdictions throughout the West dealing with the same changing climate, the same yeah. uh, water supply challenges? Yeah. Yeah, I certainly know that um, the, the wastewater treatment process that we um, engaged in with the constructed wetlands saved us hundreds of millions of dollars in terms of what we would have otherwise had to spend. So simply from a financial perspective, it made a lot of sense, but also the benefits that we accrue from the flood attenuation, um, flood risk management uh, from, from the ecosystem restoration and the, the visitors we get from not only in, around the world, but also from our local community and across the United States make this a really valuable project. So certainly we have found it extremely beneficial um, and I would definitely advocate for looking at ways to have those multiple uses of water that provide those multiple benefits that we've seen from Trace Rios. Excellent, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, that was an interesting uh, description of the, the uh, uh, the work that you've done out there is really ingenious and it's highly commendable. Um, Senator Kelly, uh, good to see you. Uh, others have been, I've been noting uh, whether we, uh, we have, uh, with respect to some of these issues, looking forward to the uh, future of our planet, that uh, we have a dog in this fight, in these fights. And, and um, we also have children and grandchildren. Thank and, you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. You have both. So you're right. Senator P Padilla was a great lead in to me, but yes. I will uh, first defer to my colleague on the other side of the aisle. Oh, if okay. He's ready. Larry's, Lindsay, I'm sorry. Yeah. 
Jump right in, bud. Thanks, Senator Kelly. I'll be very welcome, Ms. Riggin. How are you doing? Uh, appreciate you coming to the committee, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for having the hearing. And to my colleagues, we're trying to figure out how to say this. Uh, the name of this, <laughs> this entity down in South Carolina, we're tripping over it pretty badly. Okay, but we'll, we'll get, get it. There. We'll get it down. Okay, uh, you know, I was very much involved with you. I was just impressed with how you brought people together. The Crab Bank. I mean, it's a place for birds to nest, right? And uh, it was a win-win with a city of Mount Pleasant, the DNR, the Corps of Engineers. If you could just tell the chairman a little bit about the project, but how, what was the key to bringing people together? Thank you, Senator Graham. I appreciate the invite to be here and I appreciate the support from your staff as well today. Um, you know, I think the key to the hurdle that we ran into with concerns regarding the project. And so there, Crab Bank sits at the mouth of Shim Creek and there was some, some concern from the community. When you hear you're gonna put 660,000 cubic yards of material, they have concerns about where that material is gonna go. And so we, we had an opportunity with the Corps of Engineers and thankfully the dredging timelines worked out that we were able to go and rerun a coastal model to help provide some data um, as to where the material would go, as well as when we went through the feasibility process, we had 25 different alternatives of a footprint that we were looking at for Crab Bank. And so because that we had so many choices on the table and we had additional data and time, we were able to you know, calm the, the fears and concerns of folks where that material was gonna go and making sure that it was gonna stay on Crab Bank. But I think the key to that is just people being open and honest and the continued communication between not only DNR working with the town of Mount Pleasant, but also the Army Corps of Engineers sitting down with the town of Mount Pleasant, that we were all coming at it together, knowing that we had the goal in mind for this island for shorebird conservation, and everybody bought into that idea. It was just we had to make sure that everybody was comfortable with how we were gonna go about doing that. And I think it's just open and honest communication and often. Well, our office was a part of that, and I want to echo, I appreciate the role you played in the DNR and, and all the agencies involved, state, local, and federal, and I think it was a win-win. So thank you very much. Appreciate you giving me a chance to speak there, Senator Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No. No, we're delighted that you could join us. Thanks. Always. All right, Senator Kelly, you're on. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I want to uh, extend a very special welcome to Tricia Balef, who's joining us today from the city of Phoenix. Um, and I want to follow up on Senator Padilla's comments and questions about Trace Rios and um, the vision for renewed Salt River uh, in the Phoenix area. Uh, that was championed by my predecessor, Senator John McCain. Um, also, I want to acknowledge the work of uh, Mayor Gallego and the City of Phoenix, they've done to advance these projects in partnership with federal agencies, including the Army Corps. So these projects um, that we already talked about a little bit show how investments made by the Corps and their local partners can improve water quality, recharge aquifers, and support water conservation even in a desert. Um, and there were a few of these benefits that I want to discuss. You talked about, first, about hundreds of millions of dollars of savings in water you know, treatment costs. I think it was about $375 million. Can you explain how that project on uh, the Trace Rios wetlands and the uh, water, how it has um, saved the city, like specifically how that project has saved the city $375 million. Thank you, Senator Kelly, and thank you for having me here. Um, yes, absolutely. So the oh, back in the late 1990s, I would say, um, there were new Clean Water Act requirements through the Environmental Protection Agency for discharges of wastewater into waters of the United States um, that were going to necessitate some significant infrastructure investments um, for in our existing wastewater treatment plant. And, and um, we had been working with uh, demonstration wetlands to see how they would effectively treat this kind of uh, to these levels. It turns out it was really effective. And so um, in partnership with the Corps through Trace Rios, we created these full-scale, really significant um, 
hundreds of acres uh, of wetlands that are actually functionally for treatment through passive removal of nitrogen, through soil processes, through plant processes, um, and also through the attenuation of chlorine levels as it moves slowly through these wetland ponds. The sunlight helps to dissipate the chlorine, helps us to meet our standards. So does that mean, if since it's downstream, so the wetlands are downstream of the wastewater plant, mm -hmm. Does that mean you can push water through the treatment plant faster? And maybe, I mean, is it less energy costs? I do yeah, like where is the financial savings coming from? So the financial savings is the avoided costs of the infrastructure um, that we would have had to construct otherwise. In terms of energy costs and timelines, I'd have to check on that. So it's really, you don't you have to build less infrastructure because you have this downstream we wetland. We did not have to build the hard infrastructure because of the wetlands. Okay. Yeah. And another benefit I want to mention here is the recreational use of those wetlands, Trace Rios, fishing, hiking, and there's others, you know, certainly, you know, maybe even now with the amount of water that's there, you know, kayaking. Can you explain how the next phase of Trace Rios will enhance the recreational benefits of this project, and what else will phase 3C of the project include? Yes, thank you, Senator Kelly, I'm happy to. Um, so right now, uh, the maintenance paths are used as trails by folks who come visit, but it, there are no trailheads. It's not technically open to the public per se because there are no formal trailheads for them to enter through. So the the amount, the number of people who can come at one, one time is pretty limited, um, and it is really only at one location. So um, in phase 3C, part of the finishing phases of Trace Rios is to construct some trailheads along the, the Trace Rios so that really it opens access and a lot more people can come and enjoy, especially those from the neighboring communities. And the rest of phase 3C is really finishing up the in-river restoration on the western end of the Trace Rios property um, down to the Agua Fria River. And can you confirm that the reason the city and the Corps can't begin work on this next phase of, phase of the project is because there is not the authorization from Congress yet? That is correct, yes. Well, Mr. Chairman, Chair, Mr. Chairman, I hope that in the next WERDA bill, we can include that authorization so they can finish phase three of the Trace Rios project and the city can move forward on this project. Right. And I am out of time, but I have another no, question. No, go ahead, please. All right. Ms. Bell, if, uh, still, um, you know, there are, uh, I think in your opening testimony, you may have uh, talked about a little bit more of the Salt River ecosystem. Uh, I wasn't there for that. But can you explain to the committee um, the issue of the salt cedars on the Salt River um, and what risk they pose to the city and the region? Yes, thank you, Senator Kelly. Salt cedar, for those of you not in the Southwest, you may not be familiar with it, but um, it is a highly invasive um, shrubby tree, forms in really dense stands, and it creates, uh, it has a lot of litter and debris that, that fall off of it. It also secretes a lot of soil, it drops a lot of um, salt into the soil. And so it creates these highly saline soils and also creates a really high fire risk. Um, it also recovers really well from fire risk more than our native species. So it really does push out a lot of our native habitat and create a monoculture, which can, is also just creates a lot of risk um, in terms of fire and disease and, and other detrimental things to ecosystem restoration. And what has the, the city of Phoenix done to try to remove these, these salt cedars? Um, yes, it's a it's a very difficult problem plaguing a lot of a lot of agencies across the Southwest. Um, so Trace Rios removed a lot of salt cedar. It was a huge benefit to the river in that area. But it is an ongoing challenge. We do continually remove. We also really try to replant with native species whenever we remove, so that it gives them a competitive advantage to be able to to take root and, and outcompete the salt cedar as it tries to resprout. What can the Army Corps do to help? Uh, you know what? More projects to help remove salt cedar would be fantastic. <laughs> Is there any innovation out there? Is there any, are they trying to, instead of remove it, and I know there's always risk in doing this, but are there any pilot projects that are taking a different approach? 
Senator Kelly, I'm not aware of any pilot projects. I think where we're at right now is trying to find the appropriate balance of, of managing salt cedar, increasing native habitat, but accepting that probably there's going to be some level of salt cedar in our southwest systems, and how can we manage that and keep it to the minimum possible? Um, and I think really the most effective method is when you remove um, you replant with native species and if necessary salt tolerant species and, and gradually attenuate the soil so that you can then have more of the riparian species you're looking for. And how do we wind up with this plant in the southwest? Uh, yeah, it was so many, many decades ago that it came in from Eurasia, is my understanding, that it was introduced for um, multiple reasons, flood control, and I believe even uh, aesthetic reasons. It can be quite beautiful when it's flowering, unfortunately. Um, and, and I believe that that's how it came in. And then, of course, it's highly competitive, so it kind of took off and spread on its own. Well, thank you. And thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Chairman, for the extra time. Glad you could come. And uh, thanks for bringing your witness with us. Uh, it's very, very interesting, very helpful. Thank you. Um, the, uh, we start off, I, I ask uh, uh, Mr. Eichenberg to, uh, to uh, think out loud for us uh, at the beginning of our hearing, uh, why uh, should young people, the age of his son, kids in high school, maybe beyond high school, why, why should they care about the, the issues that we're discussing today? And he get, shared some thoughts with us. The same question, Ms. Balfe, uh, why should kids, young people in high school, going off into college, off into the world, why should they care about this? Uh, these issues? And then Ms. Reagan, the same question. Yes, thank you, Senator Carper. It's a great question. Um, <clears throat> so I think that there are, uh, there are a few different reasons for this, one of which, of course, is do we want our kids to inherit a world in which our rivers are dry and dusty in the Southwest with nothing in them but, but landfills and, and sand and gravel pits? I think we probably want more for them, and I think they want more for themselves. Um, I think also as we go out into these areas and we experience the benefits of them um, that come to us, especially for those in college who might be having to study for a test or something. Um, but, but in all reality, from a water quality perspective, um, from, a, flood, from a, a fire risk management perspective, the, the benefits to our surrounding area, to our air quality, to our water quality, they are significant. Um, these riparian areas provide a lot of filtration benefits that we can't really get without really expensive infrastructure otherwise. So um, in terms of cost effectiveness, these are a really cost effective way to help achieve some of our, our goals for quality. Good, thanks, thanks for that. Ms. Regan, any thoughts please? Just to add, you know, people, people should care because this is our home. This is, you know, we read about habitats and ecosystems in, in textbooks, but we don't often put ourselves as we are in that habitat. We are a part of that ecosystem. And the more that we can take care of it, the more that we care about it, the more that we all are stewards of it. The, the natural resource professionals aren't lifting the heavy load alone. We're carrying it together to protect our air, our water, our landscapes so that it's not just a, a cool place to go hike, that we're, we're going off to visit, it's a place that supports our clean air, our clean water. So the, the why is because we are here and we are part of that ecosystem. Good. Every, every now and then uh, we are uh, fortunate to have um, uh, a leader of another nation to come to uh, Washington, to Capitol Hill, and speak at a joint session of the Congress. And we usually meet um, in the House uh, chamber because it's bigger than the Senate chamber. And we have House and Senate members that are there. One of my, uh, I think one of the more interesting speakers in recent years has been uh, the President of France, President Macron, who came and spoke to us, not in French, but in perfect English. And one of the things he said to us in his, uh, in his speech, he said that he talked about our planet. And uh, he said this is, uh, the, uh, the, this is the only planet we're gonna have. And he said there is no planet B, this is it. This is it, we've got to take care of it. I, I will never forget that. I used that uh, line a whole lot since I heard it from him. He was, he was a special guest at a, um, a state dinner hosted by President and Mrs. Biden, and I got to see him at President McCone again. I told him about that line. He reminded him how he'd used that and how I, I uh, have stolen it <laughs> and never given him any credit for it. <laughs> and he said, we have a special word in French for people like you <laughs> who <laughs> use, our, use our best material without acknowledgement. <laughs> All right. Um, the, uh, 
I have a, my, my staff's giving me a question that I, I'm, I'm going to go ahead. And I have a bunch of questions we want to ask. I'm just going to lead it off with uh, with this one, and we'll start uh, so I don't get in trouble with them. Uh, that um, uh, the uh, the environmental benefits of the core's the ecosystem uh, restoration portfolio, including those uh, projects that we're talking about here, to today clearly show a response to climate change through increasing uh, resilience. And at the at the same time, these projects promote the economic uh, health of the communities that you represent and that, that, that I represent, Center Capital and others represent, through activities such as navigation, um, agriculture, and ecotourism. Here's a question, and I'll start with you, Ms. Riggin, and we'll just go to your right, uh, please. But uh, it'd be helpful if, if you would to lead us off and take a minute or two to uh, uh, elaborate for us on the challenges and the opportunities, challenges and the opportunities in partnering with the, uh, the core on ecosystem restoration. Uh, clearly, something is working and working right. Uh, but I, I, I know we can always find room for improvement. So, um, if we could just uh, start with uh, with that, uh, and it will come down to 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 Ms. Ballop and then to Mr. Eichenberg, please. Any thoughts? So, Crab Bank was my first ecosystem restoration project. So, I don't have a ton of experience under my belt. But I would I would think that the more that we could do those types of projects, <clears throat> excuse me the better that we're all going to end up being and the more that we give the flexibility to the core to be able to work with those non-federal sponsors to accomplish those goals. A lot of times um, there are very rigid timelines, very rigid points at which the project is managed and the more flexibility that we have to develop a project which allows us to go back and do things like we did with rerun a model, provide additional information or go further and monitor the project post-construction so that we have some data to support future successes and, and document what we accomplished so that we can learn from it and use that to replicate in other projects. All right, good, thanks. Same question, Ms. Ballard, would you take a shot at that one? Yes, thank, thank you, you, Senator Kerper. Um, yes, I think that uh, flexibility is probably one of the most important things that we can we can gain with the core. I think that they have so much capability in their offices, and they have, um, at least in, in our district, I know they have a lot of passion for these projects, and we have just had such um, wonderful working relationships with the folks in the Los Angeles district. We're really grateful for them and for their efforts. Um, I think certainly, um, I think I mentioned this before, but, but after the fact, long term, um, allowing the core the flexibility to stay involved um, in the restoration projects that they do perform and so that when when things come up, you know, we can circle back around to them and they would have the resources to be able to work with us to, um, fine tune and you know uh, shift things as needed as we're finding and discovering more information as we move along these projects would be incredibly helpful. All right, good, thanks. And uh, Mr. Eichenberg with the, uh, the Everlades in mind, same, same question, just elaborate a bit for us if you would on the challenges and, and the opportunities on partnering with the Corps. Mr. Chairman, I, I mentioned that uh, this issue is a national model and it's taken time to get to that point. Um, 23 years now into the process of a restoration effort between the Army Corps and a non-federal sponsor of the, the state of Florida. I, I do want to give a, a plug for the uh, regular order on the Water Resources Development Act. Having the ability for the Army Corps, hearing issues on the ground, understanding the importance of having those authorizations or those tweaks, those refinements, um, there is an integrated delivery schedule that the Army Corps of Engineers and the South Florida Water Management District have outlined. It takes us through the end of this decade. Uh, it is clear. It demonstrates exactly what needs to occur. But there are moments when both sides, along with stakeholders like the Everglades Foundation, offering suggestions uh, for uh, word of bills to be available to, again, in enable and ensure that these projects come to fruition. Um, we've come a long way. Um, the ability not only to um, preserve a drinking water supply for a growing population, but these added benefits, these uh, economic benefits that come with this, uh, the issues relating to um, storing and sending water south, recharging an aquifer, that's the drinking water supply now for almost 6 million people, um, and then alone the benefits of pushing against sea level rise and saltwater intrusion. Um, this issue covers the gamut uh, and having the Army Corps of Engineers 
uh, identifying the challenges and not backing away from them and seeking assistance uh, from non-NGOs uh, or the uh, state of Florida to assist in that regard. I, uh, I salute the Corps from Jacksonville to Atlanta to Washington in making this, um, in making this effort again a national model for, for the nation. Good, thank you. Speaking of uh, sea level rise, as, as a, a senator from the lowest lying state uh, in, uh, in the United States, uh, our s state is uh, sinking, seas around us are rising, not a good combination. But uh, we have a special concern about the climate uh, changes driving sea level rise and land uh, subsidence and flooding in our states and other states on, on the coasts. According to a Climate Change 2023 uh, synthesis uh, report summary for policymakers from something called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the largest driver of climate uh, change is carbon in our environment, resulting in unprecedented rising global temperatures and corresponding extreme weather events. The same report, however, also points to carbon reduction benefits associated with ecosystem restoration. Question, would you please, this is for you, Mr. Eichenberg, please uh, explain, explain for us how the Everglades Project is helping to address the root causes of climate change through uh, environmental restoration. And uh, please also explain for us the significance of the climate mitigation and resilience benefits seen in the Everglades uh, thus far. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, um, I think it's uh, important to point out that the Everglades itself, these organic peat soils in the Everglades have been sequestering or capturing uh, carbon for um, centuries. Uh, it's been building over time. Um, and as we continue to move in the direction of hydrating these wetlands, um, again, this is a massive plumbing project in Florida to redirect the way fresh water flows. And by storing, cleaning, and sending that water south, you're rehydrating wetlands, a massive uh, wetland forest, a, a, uh, a significant wetland uh, uh, area within our, within our world. Um, be able to, the ability to hydrate those wetlands sequesters carbon. Um, it takes off roughly about 230,000 cars off the road just in freshwater wetlands. Um, and, the, and the climate benefits of, of keeping those wetlands hydrated. Um, we're also seeing benefits along the coast. The mangroves that surround the uh, Florida Peninsula also adds a tremendous benefit on, the, um, on, the, on a carbon bank, which the Everglades is. Um, and and by, by having that head of fresh water flowing down to the Florida Keys through Everglades National Park, down to Florida Bay, it's recharging the Biscayne Aquifer. And that porous limestone within the Everglades, the fresh water permeates through that limestone and pushes eastward. And it acts as a buffer. It pushes against uh, saltwater intrusion, the issues along uh, South Florida's coast with sea level rise. You cannot abandon, we cannot abandon the issue of restoration within the Everglades uh, to deal strictly or solely with the climate concerns along the coast. They both are interconnected. Uh, it complements it, and that's why with the Army Corps of Engineers, the state of Florida moving in a very aggressive way to see this restoration, the adaptation, the mitigation issues that come with it are very positive. Good. Thank you. Thank you for that. Ms. Balif, we've, we've already talked, I'm going to raise, uh, raise a, a question here. We've already talked about the, the question uh, I'm about to raise a little bit. You may want to add to what's already been said uh, with, uh, with regards to us, but uh, we understand from your testimony that the Tres Rios Project repurposed treated wastewater uh, in the restoration of some 1,200 acres of wetland in the desert, quite a, a noteworthy uh, feature. Uh, in addition to these wetlands and restoration features, the project provides for flood protection and local recreation. My question is, please share with us, just to supplement what you've already said, but anything else you might like to add, how this unique project came together uh, with a diverse group of stakeholders that traditionally do not work uh, with the Army Corps of Engineers. Well, what were some of the challenges in setting up um, these, uh, this creative approach to ecosystem restoration? And if you could think of how some, some of those challenges were overcome, uh, that would be welcome too. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Carper. 
Um, so I was, I was actually not involved with the very beginnings of Trace Rios, um, so I don't have any first-hand knowledge of that, but I do know that a, a very significant um, group of stakeholders was brought together, including the, uh, not just the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, but also the Environmental Protection Agency. Again, we had to meet those Clean Water Act requirements, right? And uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Gila River Indian Community, and, and others. Um, and it's been a really successful partnership. Um, and I would, I would say it has even expanded since that time. So as we have been working to get continued authorization to complete Trace Rios, so we have an entire um, collaborative group of stakeholders representing private parties, nonprofits, um, state and local agencies, and federal agencies that are all um, coordinating together to make this happen, including the Arizona Game and Fish Department and Arizona State University and the Rio Reimagined Project. Um, so I would say that that has given a lot of strength to, to our efforts because it has allowed these different perspectives to be brought in. It has also allowed for everyone's ideas and thoughts to be heard ahead of time so that we can figure out the right solution and the right path forward to achieve um, a, sol a solution that makes people feel um, like they are, they are achieving what they want to, right? Like they are getting what they want out of this project and what they need out of this project. And that's been so really valuable. What we want them to feel like they've been listened to. Mm. Yeah, it's absolutely incredibly important. Yeah. Um, and also to have their ideas implemented into the project is really important. Yeah. Good, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, if I could, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Riggins uh, to talk with us about a dynamic system. And uh, I'll set up the question by saying, maintaining a project like the Crab Bank requires uh, the stakeholder to think about a long-term project plan and life cycle challenges and costs. Water is a dy uh, dynamic force as we know, and it comes with uh, uh, erosion and other shifting environmental factors. Here's my question. Recognizing that uh, restoration does not stop with one investment, what considerations go into approaching long-term success of a restoration project such as Crab Bank? And are you thinking about next steps to uh, preserve or maybe to alter the project to ensure long-term viability? So building a seabird or shorebird island is tricky because by nature, those types of ecosystems are dynamic. Um, we have five seabird sanctuaries off the coast of South Carolina, and all of them are ebbing and flowing and changing with tides and storms, and, and that's just part of it. That's what those seabirds and shorebirds really like. Um, they also really like our beaches, but we like our beaches too, and the two of us combined don't, don't go well together. Um, so building Crab Bank, while there was a $1.4 million tr price tag initially, everybody found the value in providing any available nesting habitat knowing that shorebirds and seabirds are in crisis. So we wanted to ensure that we could provide the habitat as long as we could, um, knowing that na Mother Nature is going to do what Mother Nature is going to do. There are going to be tropical storms. There are going to be hurricanes that are going to change the footprint of that island. But if we get one successful nesting season, last year we had 500 nests, and that doesn't count individual chicks in each of those nests, um, that, that matters. That, that counts. And so the, the, the investment from the department and the community and the conservation partners is we need all the available nesting shorebird habitat that we can. We know that the project was modeled that given the past history of the current storms, it should last for 50 years. Um, there is hope that maybe there'll be additional dredging material opportunities in the future, as we know that there are limited places for dredge material to go, but it has to be the right sediment composition for us to be able to add it back to the island to maintain that in the future. So while 50 years may seem like a short amount of time, if we get back to historic numbers of crab bank in the five to 10 thousands of nests, it's worth it. All right, good, thank you. Thank you for that response. Uh, I have uh, maybe another question for each of, of you. And uh, then uh, at, at the very end of the hearing, I'm gonna just ask you, uh, is there a question you wish you'd been asked but were not asked? It's a question you wish you would, had been asked but uh, you've not been asked. And uh, you could tell us what that question might be, and then, if you will, answer it. So, but uh, that uh, will uh, will uh, take it'll take us a few more minutes to get to that point in the in the, in the hearing. Uh, I, if I could, in the meantime, Mr. Eichenberg, 
uh, something with respect, a question with respect to process. Um, the, uh, the Everglades, as we know, is a complex uh, program, uh, a program, very complex program, uh, compri comprised of a whole lot of uh, projects. They range in size, they range in scope, they range in objectives. Please uh, describe, if you will, the, the input that the Everglades Foundation and its partners provide to the Corps, the Army Corps of Engineers, for the Everglades restoration process in order to ensure that restoration proceeds in a timely way and meets intended outcomes. And do you as a stakeholder in the process feel that your voice is heard? Mr. Chairman, to the, um, to the second portion of your question, the answer is yes. Um, the ability as a um, non, uh, as an NGO to be, be able to go to the core uh, with the expertise that the foundation has, um, we, ha we have, um, tremendous expertise within the science of the Everglades. And a lot of this is modeling. It's um, hydrological modeling, it's ecological uh, modeling, it's economic uh, results. And to be able to run those scenarios with a variety of, of assumptions. The Army Corps has their process, the South Florida Water Management District uh, has theirs, and at, at the Everglades Foundation, we're proud to be able to do the same thing, the same type of modeling. And to then be able to go to the Army Corps with suggestions, to think maybe differently over here or over there, and to, uh, to have that ability to sit across a table and express those results and realize that it's being heard. Um, it may not make the final result, but nine out of 10 times, there's different portions of what's being recommended, not just by us, but also by the other partners from Audubon, Florida, um, to uh, the Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation, Captains for Clean Water, and countless others who are expressing the desire to see this project come to fruition. So I want to give a shout out to Colonel Booth in Jacksonville, the commander at the district. Um, he is accessible. He travels throughout Florida to make sure voices are being heard. And um, again, the economic return on this. We, t we heard about the, the, the population of wading birds or shorebirds coming back. The example for the Corps on their work in the Kissimmee River, that floodplain has returned. The wading bird population has come back in droves. The same Army Corps that dug the channel south of Orlando that drained that floodplain in the 60s for now to be fully restored, the meandering Kissimmee is back. That's an example of the Army Corps understanding not just the ecological returns, but also the economics, the ecotourism benefits to the state of Florida and to the nation are tremendous. So that's, um, that's kind of how we see it as it relates to a, um, an organization that is at the table and has a voice in this process. Thank you for that. Did, did you say Captains for Clean Water? Is that what you said? Yes, it's a, a group that was founded in 2016 when there was some algae outbreaks uh, around Fort Myers. And Mr. Chairman, I will tell you, anglers, boat captains, uh, those that make a uh, livelihood on the water. I was standing in a boat in 2016 and the gentleman said, I don't know where your office is, but you're standing in mine. And my office is closed because of the way water is being managed in Florida. So they've come to the table with realtors, chambers of commerce. This is a business, it's an economic message as much as it's ecological. And those groups and others are having a tremendous impact. Yeah, we have a local chapter of Captains for Clean Water on this committee. Uh, Senator Kelly and I are both retired Navy captains. <laughs> Thank and we you for are your very service. For clean water. Yes, sir. Uh, I have uh, one, one uh, other question I'm gonna ask for. Ms. Ballop, uh, it deals with, uh, so really, if you will, a, a general reevaluation uh, report. I think this, there's an acronym for that, but I, what is it, uh, GRR? Is it, have you ever heard of that? I think you have. But uh, I understand that there's some remaining construction features for the Tres Rios uh, project with a reevaluation of the project underway to address increased increase cost and next uh, steps. Could you tell us just a little bit more about the phasing of the project and, and your work uh, with the core to ensure benefits are seen without all of the features completed. 
Yes, thank you, Senator Carper. Yes, there is a post authorization change report underway right now for a cost update for the final, the final phases of Trace Rios to be completed. But in the meantime, many of the phases of Trace Rios have been completed, including the levy, which is already providing vast benefits to the neighboring communities that's removed from the floodplain as a result of construction of that. There's also, of course, the treatment wetlands that we talked about that are already providing the benefits for water quality that have, was released into the river. Um, we also have overbank wetlands and some in-river restoration that people can access and they do, and they, they come over from across the nation and all over the world to fish and to bird watch. There's over 200 species of birds. We have pelicans in Arizona, in Phoenix, <laughs> because of these wetlands. Um, so there is significant bird watching opportunities. Um, Audubon, Arizona does surveys um, along with game and fish for us, and we have threatened and endangered species there. Um, so we are definitely, um, we have conferences come out uh, from across the nation and across the world to, to look at Trace Rios and see what's been accomplished here and see the success of the project. So it is definitely being noticed, um, and we look forward to that notice increasing uh, as we complete it and, and open up those trailheads and the rest of the in-river restoration. Good. Thank you. Um, earlier, earlier in the, uh, the, uh, the hearing, I, I asked uh, you, and then I found that I should have asked Ms. Riggin when she figured out in her life what she, you know, why, why she was born. And uh, she gave us a great answer about being the light, what, eighth grade? And when the light went off in, in your head. Uh, Ms. Balfe, when, when did you figure out why you were born? Oh, I think it took me a little bit longer. Um, I, I, I played around with a lot of different reasons, I guess, for why I was born. Um, but I think really I came to my career. I think I was I, born to play third base for the Detroit Tigers. <laughs> Unfortunately, they, they had different ideas. <laughs> Uh, yes, I, I really came to it in college, you know, I was in college and I was trying some, some different majors out and um, ended up in forestry at Colorado State University and um, it really clicked with me and, and my love of the outdoors and my appreciation of what nature gives me personally um, and what I could then do to support it right back. Is really what brought me to it. Oh, that's good, good. So I can work the same question. When, when did you figure out that your son will be interested in this? <laughs> when did you figure out why, why you were born? I think my, um, my moment was in high school. I attended Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. And uh, my 11th grade government teacher, Doug Pierce. Now you still remember his name. He'd be pleased if he's uh, listening in. I hope he is. If he's not, I want to send him this clip. Um, <laughs> Doug Pierce is the person who uh, got me interested in... Uh, policy and public uh, politics and the importance of government service. And I watched I, I my mentor, Clay Shaw, who, was, who spearheaded the comprehensive Everglades restoration plan through yep. the Congress yep. in 2000. And I got to see firsthand as a native Floridian, Clay Shaw, the importance of balancing the environment with economic development in Florida. And this is, this, we've been doing this for years, Mr. Chairman, as you know, decades. Uh, generations upon generations have either messed it up and now we're fixing it. And for me to be able to um, be here in Washington in years past to see how this process works, to understand the bipartisan nature of the environment, conservation, regardless of our party affiliations, we all unite for clean water, clean air, uh, healthy wetlands, uh, drinking water. Um, and this, the Everglades is the perfect example for all of that to come together. Uh, not only am I proud that my son Patrick's here with me, but I have three other children. Um, and the example that we're doing within the Everglades um, is, is the example to pass on for future generations. And Doug Pierce was the key for me back in 1993, um, 30 years ago. And I hope that anyone listening to this message of hope and, and, and success around the environment across the country engages them to be a part of something bitter, bigger than themselves. Great. Thank you for that. And uh, Doug Pierce, if you're out there, thanks very much. You get a big assist on the play. Uh, I, now that I know that we're going to cl close out with this, I'm gonna, I said I just wanted you to give us each a question that you wish had been asked and that weren't. And uh, if you had been asked a question, how would you have responded? Go ahead, Ms. Rigan. 
Thank you, Senator Carper. I, I really can't think of anything that I would like to share more about the project. I'm, I'm excited that I was asked to be here today to share the success of Crab Bank. Um, I'm thankful for the support of all the conservation community entities that helped raise money for the project to help us get us here. Um, and I'm excited to share, and I touched on it a little bit earlier, about the fact that Crab Bank was so much more than just that one project. Um, by building the relationships with the conservation community and others and highlighting the need for support for shorebird, seabird, wading bird conservation, you know, we, we had the ability to establish this South Carolina Coastal Bird Conservation Fund that has allowed us to do even more. Um, and we have around $400,000 in the fund that helps us leverage federal grants um, to continue and further shorebird conservation for the future. And fingers crossed sitting back here for the recoveries, Recovering America's Wildlife Act um, and hoping that, you know, we'll have a steady, constant, consistent funding stream to support non-game wildlife management in states across the country like we do with the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Thank you. All right. Yes, thank you. Same question. What would you like to have been asked that you weren't? Oh, yes, I would have loved to have been asked, what's next after Trace Rios? Yeah, what's next after Trace Rios? I thank, thank you, Senator Carper, for asking that excellent question. I'm happy to respond to it. Uh, what's next after Trace Rios is Rio Salado Oeste, which is a really important um, ecosystem restoration project in the Salt River that it will connect our completed Rio Salado Phoenix, which is our completed ecosystem restoration project, with Trace Rios. So right now, we have about an eight-mile gap in restoration between those two projects, and Rio Salado Oeste will fill that gap and will give us 19 contiguous miles of restored salt river through metropolitan Phoenix, how many, through how many surrounding miles? disadvantage. How many, how many, you say 19? 19 contiguous miles of restored river once all three of these projects are complete. So we're very excited. Um, we did get the, uh, the project got um, work plan monies for the core to start working on the general reevaluation report for Rio Salado Oeste. Um, so we're getting that underway and really excited for the next steps on that project as well. All right, good, thanks. Good question. All right, <laughs> Mr. Eichenberg. Mr. Chairman, I, I think the question of will we ever finish Everglades restoration, because mm. um, we hear that, and I'll be brief. I think the answer is yes. I know the answer is yes. And by the year 2030, the remainder of this decade, with critical projects that are being uh, planned and uh, are ready for construction, we will do that. And then we shift to perpetual protection because again, the next generation is going to have to ensure that what we have fought for, these remaining three million acres of Everglades that we are protecting uh, survives. So we know the problem, we have the solution, and what I wanna also highlight, Mr. Chairman, is the political will has really stepped up in a manner that is delivering this. This is a mainstream issue now. And uh, the, the ability from uh, the president and the Congress to the governor and the state legislature, everyone is moving in the same direction. There is massive momentum around Everglades restoration. This is a national treasure. It is America's Everglades. And with your help and those on the ground back in Florida, we will get it done. Yeah, that's great. I, my, my colleagues hear me say uh, probably too often, bipartisan solutions are lasting solutions. And I think uh, that's just another way of saying uh, as part of what you just said, I think, is most, uh, most helpful. Um, uh, I have uh, some boilerplate language I'm going to use in just a minute before we close, uh, close out the, uh, the hearing. But um, uh, I ride the train a lot to, to um, uh, back and forth from Delaware to Washington to come to work, and uh, every day almost. And uh, another guy who used to ride the train a lot was uh, Albert Einstein. And uh, Albert Einstein, um, uh, I, I don't know if he's, if it was in Princeton, I think it was maybe in Princeton where he, he taught. And he'd get on a train, he'd go to New York, he'd get on a train, he'd come to D.C., but he trained a lot. One day he got on a train and uh, he um, started looking for his ticket and he couldn't find it. He was looking at his coat, his, his trousers, he looked in his briefcase, couldn't find his ticket. And the conductor comes along and says, Mr. Ryan, Dr. Einstein, we know who you are, don't worry about it, you're, you're fine, you don't have to worry about it. And the conductor starts, walks away to go to the next car and he turns around and he looks in, back at Dr. Einstein and Dr. Einstein's down on his hands and knees and uh, looking for his ticket. The conductor runs back there and says, Dr. Einstein, you don't have to do this, we know who you are, we know who you are. Dr. Einstein uh, um, looks up at him and said, 
I know who I am too, I just don't know where I'm going. I don't know where I'm going. Uh, you've given us, I, I think one of the best ways to figure out where to go is to find out what works and, uh, and do more of that. One of the things I think that works is regular order. That term's been used a number of times. It's one of the things that Senator Capito and I think uh, our colleagues, both Democrat and Republican on this committee, agree. We like uh, regular order. We like working with states. We, like, uh, we love working with the Army Corps of Engineers, and we have oversight over them. But uh, they do great work in, in our state and 49 other states as well, and we're in their, uh, we're in their debt. The, um, uh, the, uh, the one of the, speaking of uh, uh, Albert Einstein, one of the, a lot of people remember his, he once said, uh, um, what his definition of insanity is to con keep doing the same thing over and over again, expect a different result. That's a good, that's a good quote, but my favorite Einstein is in adversity lies opportunity. In adversity lies opportunity, that's a great one. I use that every day. And there's plenty of adversity uh, in our states, in our country, in our world, but there's also opportunity. And the key is to find uh, in that adversity the real opportunities. And I think that's part of what we're talking about here doing today. And uh, finally, uh, I'd like to say, uh, find out what works, do more of that. Find out what works, do more of that. And you all have given us some great uh, examples of what works. And uh, that we can be inspired by you and to learn from what is going on in your states. And we applaud you for, for that. Now to the boilerplate. Uh, before we adjourn, some housekeeping. And uh, our senators, our colleagues will be allowed to submit written questions for the record by 4 p.m. on Wednesday, um, June 21st. That's a couple of weeks from today, two weeks from today, I think. And we'll compile uh, those questions. We'll send them to uh, each of you. We're gonna ask you to try to reply to us by Wednesday, July 12th. We'll, we'll follow up with this information with, this, with these dates. But um, we ask, ask uh, a majority, anything else? Okay, staff. Minority staff. I just want to say to our staff, so these hearings don't just happen. Uh, they happen because we have great staff members, and they help figure out who would be a good witnesses to bring in and get everything coordinated and uh, uh, provide us uh, with uh, just enormous amount of support and help. And I just want to say to, uh, to all of you, thank you uh, very, very much. And to, the, to those of you who um, uh, spend your life uh, this is this is your life, a big part of your life, what you do, and uh, you're not just doing it for yourselves and your families. You're doing it for the rest of us, and uh, uh, we thank you for for that. We're inspired by you and encouraged by the work that you're doing. So with that, I think it's a wrap, and I'm going to adjourn this hearing. Thank you.